Tonight on Life on the Rock, we have Dr. Mary Healy, a professor of sacred scripture. We'll watch a cool to be Catholic short film called In His Image. We'll build the faith with Brother Leo and much more. Tonight on Life on the Rock, we have Dr. Mary Healy. She is a professor of sacred scripture at Detroit Seminary of Sacred Heart. She talked to us tonight about prayer, about the presence of God, about healing, about the, the Gospel of Mark in particular. I caught up with her at a focus conference and she had a lot to share. We also had a Building Your Faith lesson with Brother Leo. We'll now go to a Cool to be Catholic short film, In His Image, by Tyler Cadenas. I want to share one of my favorite experiences with you, but I want to show it to you through something that I love to do, and that is making films. So firstly, every film needs an interesting name. Then comes the logline. An eager teen ready to see the world sets out on a mission trip to find what he does not expect. Let's have the setting be during spring break in a little village called Tanamacoin in Mexico. Finally, every movie has a conflict and every protagonist has a mission. And as Catholics, we're all called to be saints. And I want to find exactly how I can achieve that goal and how I can get closer to God. And with that, we start our story. I think my one takeaway from this trip is that believing the church's teachings and understanding them are two completely different things. So maybe to get closer to God and to understand Him, we need to get closer to the people that we see God in. with uh, Dr. Mary Healy, a scripture professor at Sacred Heart Seminary in Detroit, uh, Michigan. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be with you. And you're giving a couple talks this weekend at the Focus Conference. One is on uh, prayer and fasting. Tell us about that. Sure. The title of the talk is With God in the Secret Place. And that's from the words of Jesus who said, when you pray, go into your room and close the door. And your Father who sees in secret will be with you. So I um, am explaining that it's very good and important and necessary to pray together with others, especially in the liturgy, the highest form of prayer, but it's also crucial to have an intimate relationship with God in the secret place because there are things about himself and about each person's life that he wants to reveal to them alone in an intimacy of, of a personal friendship and a romance that nothing can substitute for. And if you were giving person advice how to cultivate, the, cultivate that intimate relationship in prayer, what do you tell people? <laughs> well, the first thing that virtually all the spiritual writers say is make an appointment with God and stick with it. No matter how distracted you get, no matter how many um, things get thrown in your way to hinder your time of prayer, be faithful to that time of prayer course if you skip it just start back up again and even if you feel like nothing has happened in whatever time you're spending with the Lord something is happening you cannot stand next to a nuclear reactor and have nothing happen <laughs> you cannot be in the presence of the Lord of the universe no matter how distracted you may feel and have nothing happen and we see it in the Gospels nobody ever left the presence of Jesus unchanged if you came into the presence of Jesus blind, by the time you left, you weren't blind anymore. Even if you were dead, if you came into the presence of Jesus, by the time you left, you're not dead anymore. <laughs> <laughs> or burdened, guilty, ashamed, lonely, you left the presence of Jesus a new person. And that happens when we pray, yeah. even if we don't feel yeah. it at right. the time. Right, right. And especially as Catholics, to have the opportunity to pray before him in the Blessed Sacrament is even such a powerful encounter, isn't it? Radiation yeah. therapy. Yeah, yes. divine radiation. Right? Just letting him love us, uh, just being in the uh, presence of the Lord, which yeah. is so powerful, yeah. changing us at a very deep level. 
Do you have a favorite book of scripture, a favorite gospel, or? I love the Gospel of Mark, partly because I wrote a book on it, and so I, I studied it in depth. And it's a gospel that, at first glance, it may seem to not have the the same kind of substantiveness that right. we see in Luke, say, or Mark, or, or Matthew, or John. But um, even though Mark is very simple and kind of fast-paced, there's an incredible intricacy and literary artistry with which he wrote that gospel. And the more you study it, the more connections you see and the more depth there is spiritually. And it's an evangelistic gospel. I think he really meant it for people who had just been evangelized and just come to know Jesus. And it's kind of hard-hitting in a way. It's, it's full of impact. You know, he leaves out any non-essentials. And yet it, it so clearly and powerfully proclaims the good news. And he was writing for the people of Rome, right? Is that, yes, yeah, he was writing for yeah. the Christians of Rome, and um, many scholars would say it was probably during the time of the first terrible, bloody persecution of the church under Caesar Nero, when they were being thrown to the lions, they were being set on fire um, as torches for his garden parties. So incredible suffering that was being undergone by the Christians of Rome. And this gospel is clearly a gospel for people who are suffering. You know, I've, I've wondered too, and maybe if it is particularly poignant for the people of today, I mean, ancient Romans respected power and authority, yeah. and uh, he emphasizes Jesus' power and authority over demons, all that kind of stuff. It is fast-paced. You know, we live fast. We want the message quick. <laughs> and whatever yeah, it is, true. especially. <laughs> what were some of the literary things you appreciate, appreciated about it? it was, uh, well, for instance, um, if you look carefully at the Gospel, you see that the first half is is a movement in one direction where the disciples are coming to know who Jesus really is. They don't start out knowing that he's the Messiah. They don't start out knowing that he's the Son of God because they had a concept of Messiah that was very different from what he was, a political, military concept. So at the very heart of the Gospel, Peter says, you are the Messiah. And you realize it's this breakthrough, this, this burst of light. And from that point, there's a movement kind of in the opposite direction where now they're coming to know what it really means that he's the Messiah. What it means is that he's going to the cross. It, it was an earth-shattering revelation for them. It, 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 it took a tremendous revolution of mind for them to get that. It was so different from what they thought, that the way of the Messiah is the way of the cross. And in the, the first half of the Gospel, you see three reproaches all on a lake is Jesus is kind of reproaching them as they're not, they're not fully seeing the picture of right. who he really is and what he's doing. And then in the second half of the gospel, kind of mirroring that, he gives three predictions of his passion. Look guys, yeah. I'm going to die. I'm going to suffer and die and rise on the third day. And after each prediction of the passion, there's a completely bungling response. like. Lord, when you come into your glory, can we sit at your right hand and left hand? Like, yeah. <laughs> everything he just said about his mission went right over their heads. And then each of those three times, he teaches them what it means to be a disciple, to share in his cross and in his glory. So it all fits together. The whole gospel is, is like an intricate puzzle where everything is closely connected. And I think I kind of interrupted you. First you said make an appointment with God about fostering this interior relationship. What would be another point? Uh... Love the presence of God. I think even the Old Testament teaches, that, teaches us to love the presence of God through the people of Israel. Because as God was leading them through the desert for 40 years on their way to the Promised Land, which is an image of this life, right? So we are God's people in the desert of this world on our way to a better land. You know, our ultimate destiny is, is a greater place. So we're like Israel in the desert. And how God led them was with a pillar of cloud. The cloud was the sign that God was with them. It was a visible sign, he's with them. Whenever the cloud moved, they moved. The cloud stopped, they stopped. God was teaching them to love his presence, and to go where he was going, to stop if he was stopping. He wants to direct our lives that way. He wants us to be led by the cloud of his presence. It's not that we visibly see it like the Israelites, but we should have a desire like they had, and like Moses, who said, um, Lord, if your presence doesn't go with us, I'm not going. 
I can't take a step without you. I want to move where you're moving. I want to stop where you're telling me to stop. I desire you to be with me because in myself I have nothing. I have nothing to offer the world of my own resources. What I have to offer is you. And so if we take on that thirst, that hunger for the presence of God, we as temples of the Holy Spirit will be carriers of the presence of God. Because when Solomon de dedicated the temple, you know, later in the history of Israel, the cloud descended and filled the temple and, and the, the air was so thick with the presence of God they couldn't even stand to minister anymore. The temple is a foreshadowing of us. We're temples of God. So we too are meant to be filled with the cloud of His presence. Of course, not in a visible way, not always in a tangible way, but in a way that is meant to impact the people around us. And that only happens if we're in a prayer relationship with the Lord day by day, drawing from Him, absorbing His love, resting in His presence, getting to know Him, getting our identity rooted in Him. And if, if that's happening, then His presence is filling us and whatever we're giving away in our service, in our apostolate, it's Him. It's him we're giving away. It's not, you know, me. I'm well, giving away. Maybe it's a good transition for the your, another talk you gave about the Holy Spirit and evangelization. Maybe we could segue to that. Now. Sure. It's actually similar um, in, in certain ways because um, what I talk about there is that the church has called us to a new evangelization. For more than 35 years now, the church has been saying, we need to proclaim the gospel anew to the people of our time, particularly those who were baptized maybe, or had some Catholic upbringing, but no longer have any connection with God or with the church, how do we do that? Because we, if we look at the results, we have to say, well, you know, at best they're kind of mixed. <laughs> we don't see huge numbers of people flocking to the church in most parts of the world, right? We see, we see the opposite. What's missing? We have to go back and look, how did the first evangelization come about? How was it that Christianity exploded across the ancient world? This little band of fishermen and tax collectors and, and former prostitutes and ordinary people, how did they turn the world upside down for Jesus? What was the key? And in, in a word, Pentecost. It was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It, it, was, it was the crowning moment of Jesus' whole mission, as Pope Benedict said, it was the coming of the Holy Spirit so that God dwelt in them. And God was anointing them, uh, directing their words, where they would go, what they would do, so that in the Holy Spirit, they weren't just, you know, trying to convince people that they had a good thing going with Jesus, you know. They were proclaiming the truth revealed by God with conviction, with an authority, with a boldness that could only come from the Holy Spirit. And if we want the new evangelization to take off, we need a new Pentecost. <laughs> no Pentecost, no evangelization. <laughs> it's that simple. It means we need a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We need an, an encounter with the Holy Spirit. We need to experience His power so that we're walking in His power, not just in human good resources. Right, so you mentioned uh, focusing on God's presence and surrendering to His will, and letting Him lead us. There was another point to that about receiving that Holy Spirit in our prayer life that we could do? or um... Yeah, I think the most simple thing is to, what Jesus said to do, ask, ask seek, yeah. knock. Yeah. And then he said, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, right, right. how much more is the, your Heavenly Father give the yeah. Holy Spirit yeah. to those who ask? Yeah, sometimes we forget <laughs> simply to ask. Yeah. I know too, you've written a book on healing uh, is that healing in the scripture or healing in the Holy Spirit or? It's both. It's um, something that the Lord really led me to study starting four or five years ago was what is the role of healing in evangelization? It's not something I'd really thought about a lot before, but the more I studied the New Testament, the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles, and then later the writings of the Fathers of the Church, the more I realized that healings were not just a marginal peripheral thing that happened rarely every once in a while. They were actually right at the heart of evangelization. 
and a huge reason for the explosive growth of the church in the ancient world is that as the gospel was being proclaimed in a, in a world of, of pagan darkness, of, of moral and spiritual darkness, the disciples of Christ weren't just preaching the good news in words. They were actually demonstrating the truth of the words by supernatural deeds that God did to corroborate the message of the, of the words. And that that is meant to be just as much a part of evangelization today. We were never meant to proclaim the gospel in words only. God himself backs up the truth of the gospel with deeds, including deeds of healing. And do you, have you seen that uh, healing, like spiritual inner healings or physical Very healings? Very much, okay. yes, every kind of healing. Inner healing, healing of relationships, healing of people who were tremendously broken and wounded by offenses that had been committed against right. them, healing of addictions. I've, I've met people who were healed of mental illness, um, all kinds of physical healings that I've seen and, and had other people testify to. It's just incredible what the Lord is doing today. He's pulling out all the stops. Oh, good. Well, thank you so much for chatting You're welcome, with us, Father it. Mark. It's been great you. to talk to you. Hi, I'm Brother Leo Mary, and in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 105 to 108, the Church is teaching us about Scripture, the Bible, how it was written. There is one primary author, that is the Holy Spirit, and there are many other authors, they call it secondary authors. This pen right here can be a good example of that. You have one pen, but you have ten different color inks. So you have one primary author, the Holy Spirit, and He inspires the other authors, the secondary authors, to write. And so each one of those secondary authors would be like a different color on this pen. Now, the Holy Spirit uses all the gifts of those secondary authors. He doesn't just write through them and override them. He uses all their gifts. So St. Luke is a physician. He's a doctor. So when St. Luke writes the Gospel of St. Luke, he uses those gifts as a doctor, and he writes in a doctor's way of writing. Maybe not as messy. And then you have St. Matthew. He's like a, he's a tax collector. So he does a lot of numbers. And so in Matthew's Gospels, you're going to see numbers, and things fit together with a lot of numbers. And that's because the Holy Spirit is using the gifts of each one of those authors. And that's all the way back to the Old Testament. It's the same Holy Spirit who's wrote the Old Testament, the same Holy Spirit who wrote the New Testament. So that's why it's inspired. It's inspired by God. Now the sacred scriptures, the Bible, has no error in it. The Holy Spirit got these authors to write only what He wanted them to write, whatever He writ wanted written, and no more. That's the Holy Spirit. He says, whatever He wanted written, and no more. There is no error in the Bible because the Holy Spirit is the main primary author of the sacred scripture. Now in the catechism it says very beautifully, we must acknowledge that the books of scripture firmly, faithfully, and without error teach that truth which God for the sake of your salvation wished to be confided to the sacred scriptures. So God is the one who gave us the Bible and there is no error. So when you read paragraphs 105 to 108 you understand more about how the Bible was written. God bless you. I was so struck by what Dr. Mary Healy told us tonight about make an appointment with God. If you want to have a serious prayer life, you got to set an appointment to be, spend time with God and don't break it. So that's our end of the video challenge this week, to make an appointment with God. 
And we have to, she said, you know, love the presence of God. Seek him, you know, in the scriptures, in his word. Maybe you have an opportunity to go to church and adoration or mass, but love the presence of God. And the way she talked about Exodus, you know, how the people were led by that cloud, you know, the Holy Spirit leading them or the pillar of fire at night, that they were taught to depend radically on him, to follow him, to be attentive to him. And when we place ourselves in the presence of God, we're changed. God, you know, we see that continually through the scriptures. She said that people who came into the presence and contact with Jesus, they went away changed. Right. And it's whenever we pray also, it's, that's what keeps the, the fire lit. You know, and whenever we stop praying or whenever we just kind of neglect it, a lot of things in our life just start falling apart. And there's a pattern to that as well. So we always do want to keep up with that commitment. And because we receive a lot of grace in mm -hmm. prayer, and that's one of its primary importance is that you are receiving grace through many different forms. And, you know, and right. we also think of the Mass yeah. as being the highest form of prayer. Right. And that will light that fire, too. Yeah, and I was just so encouraged, again, by that we, God's at work. And you know, we, we spend that time in prayer. He's working on us. He's changing us. You know, everybody in the Scriptures who encountered Jesus experienced that. We might not feel it, but we can know it by faith. That we give God this time, He's going to do something with us. So that's our challenge. Make an appointment with God. Stick to it. Pray. Now spend time with Him. We'll send you to that vineyard with a blessing. May our Heavenly Father shine His face upon you. May He give you His peace. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We'll see you next week on Life on the Rock. in my bed now ain't no going back yeah it's time that you let it go leave the past where it belongs got a strong grip on my cross the God's help I'm moving on it's time to free your soul from the suffocating hate Jesus wiped my tears away I can finally Yo, start again I had these heavy chains that were welded to my body but started melting off when I started living godly, I began to put God first and live less blindly And let go of all the grudges I had left inside me And forgive all the people that talk bad behind me Realizing that if I had not, I'd still be dying The anger and hate will still remain I would still be suffering from all this pain It will all be done in vain I want to feel the sun, cause I'm really tired of feeling